Some of you are wondering, what is the Aspen Institute? We were founded on an animating value, a value among all values, which is human dignity. The idea that every single person has human dignity. And that's one of the reasons why we have a literary prize, so that we can organize ourselves to hear voices from all perspectives, from all realities, uh, in order to better live our own humanity and build a better society. We believe that great literature invites us into new minds and new sensibilities, allowing us to see the world from perspectives other than our own. And that awakens moral imagination. And that if the ability to imagine someone else's inner life and social world is where compassion begins, and storytelling is the art that kindles that fire. That's why we host the Literary Prize, to an influential work of literature while surfacing many works that are doing this incredible cultural work of revealing the questions that are hidden beneath our answers. His inability to find a job startled me. He was the smartest person I knew. I comprehended at a technical level what a recession was, but not what it meant, truly meant, for the people tumbling into its maw. Some half of my generation never recovered. Whatever was between them, Mauricio could see it from across the distance of the parking lot, something innocent that he envied, if innocent was the word. What was the word for it? He rested both hands on the steering wheel, patient as he watched Alonso hand over the carnations, the girl in the long skirt reaching up to receive them, her face crumbling into joy. Compromiso, he thought. He remembered. Six days sober, and the details were so crisp, I finally saw stains on my dirty sheets. Big uh. Six days wasn't very long, but I was a dog, junk dog, to wake up and fall asleep. Suddenly, people were no longer like ghosts floating around me. I stared at the coffee when I poured it from the canister into the coffee machine. I ran my fingers over the laces on my throat days. Gah, I had a laugh at myself. From early dawn when she wakes to pray until late at night before she falls into a fitful sleep, Bibi nests in a corner of the living room on the farthest edge of the second couch and listens to the television at an incredibly low volume, listens to her son and his wife in the kitchen, to her grandchildren on their phones, to the Quran on an old radio that she smuggled out of Afghanistan 40 years ago. Session one. My name is Cara Romero, and I came to this country because my husband wanted to kill me. Don't look so shocked. You're the one who asked me to say something about myself. Hello, <laughs> excuse me. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm Adrienne Brodeur, the executive director at Aspen Words. And 
This is just always, always one of my favorite nights of the year. Um, I know I speak for everyone on our team at Aspen Words to say that we're just thrilled to have you all here to help us celebrate these books and authors. For those of you who are new to Aspen Words, um, we are a literary nonprofit and program of the Aspen Institute. And our mission is to encourage writers, inspire readers, and connect people through the power of stories. And this prize just goes to the heart of our mission. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course, we are here tonight to announce the winner. That's the big moment. But we are also here to celebrate all five of these extraordinary books and their, I don't know, their courageous and talented authors. The Consequences by Manuel Munoz, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water by Angie Cruz, The Haunting of Haji Hotek by Jamil John Kochai, All This Could Be Different by Sarah Thungam Matthews, and The Blanket Dance by Oscar Hokea. I'm sorry, Hokea. Now, sadly, neither Oscar nor Sarah can be here with us tonight. Um, but I think some of their people are in the audience, um, and we know they're here in spirit. And under the header of late-breaking literary news, because that's a thing, um, Angie is running late. She's at another talk, but she is going to be here as soon as possible. So the goal of the Aspen Words Literary Prize is to spotlight novels and collections of short stories that not only have enduring literary value, but that also illuminate a pressing social or political issue, and in doing so, um, raise our, expand our perspectives, and at the same time, get us talking about these important issues that are raised. And as everyone in this room knows, because we're all readers, um, the best part of reading great fiction is is getting a lost in a world that is not your own, in finding yourself in a landscape that is unfamiliar and being in the head of a character who is not yourself. And this is where the magic of empathy happens. I'd like to give a heartfelt thanks to our selection committee and to our panel of judges. None of us envy the decisions uh, they had to make. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank all the people in the room um, who are behind these great books. And by that, I mean their literary agents, their editors, the jacket designers, the publicists, the marketing people, the sales team. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone. Um, but as someone who is a writer and also has a past as an editor, I know firsthand it takes a village to bring a book out into the world, and we thank you for bringing these five to us. Let's see. Lastly, I'd like to thank everyone else in the room, all the book lovers and readers and people who support writers and artists. Um, you are just a critical part of this process. So thanks to all of you. And now it is my honor to introduce our head judge and next speaker, Omar El Akid. I'm sorry, I don't think I pronounced that right. Omar El Akid. Omar is an author and journalist who was born in Egypt, grew up in Qatar, moved to Canada as a teen, and now lives in the US. He is the author of two beautiful works of fiction, American War, which was named a best book of the year, by the New York Times and the Washington Post, and What Strange Paradise, which won the Giller Prize, the Pacific Northwestern Northwest Booksellers Award, the Oregon Book Award for Fiction, and was shortlisted for this prize, the Aspen Words Literary Prize. Omar, will you come on up? Thank you. How are you all doing tonight? <laughs> Thank you to the three extroverts in the crowd. <laughs> You're going to be asked to do a lot of heavy lifting tonight. So, um, It is such a privilege to be here. I've, um, I've been asked to uh, talk to you for a little bit about why fiction is important. 
um, why you would come to this ceremony and think fiction is not important is beyond me, but that is not the point. Um, I thought I would start telling you, uh, by telling you a, a very short story. Um, uh, recently, I was, I was approached by the organizer of a sort of TED-like talk circuit. Um, they go from town to town, they look for people to tell interesting stories up on stage, and um, this gentleman had read my work and had asked me if I had any ideas uh, for a talk. And it was coming up on the anniversary of, um, one of the anniversaries of the Guantanamo Bay prison camps, which I had covered as a journalist. And so I said, listen, I've been to this place that not too many people have been to. I have a lot of multimedia from there. Perhaps we could do something on that. And when I finished making this pitch, he said, yeah, that's, that's fascinating, but um, do you have anything more recent? And I bring this up because I think to, to engage in the work of storytelling is by necessity to take up arms against the privilege of instantaneous forgetting. This is political work in the oldest sense of the word, politics as the study of how a society should operate and how we should be to one another. Occasionally I will hear someone say that great art somehow rises up above politics or must be apolitical, and I think this is less a statement about the nature of the art as it is about what the artist feels comfortable ignoring. I think all art is political, either by virtue of its active space, the subject matter and characters with which it chooses to engage, or its negative space, what or whom it chooses to ignore. The titles on this year's shortlist, and indeed on the long list, they vary wildly in style, in form, and in content, but they do share a commonality that renders them work of immense emotional and intellectual power. The desire to engage with people, places, and subject matter that, from the perch of privilege, it would be much easier to ignore. But to write this kind of work also entails the best kind of imaginative capacity. It imagines a world as it could be, the kind of world in which we choose not to forget one another's stories, even if the personal consequences of that forgetting might be minimal. I'm deeply grateful to the organizers of the Aspen Words Literary Prize for choosing to highlight this work, to my fellow judges for the passion and the depth of thought they invested in choosing these books, and of course to the authors themselves, who have written some of the best literature I have read in years. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to the stage two of those finalists. Please join me in welcoming Jamil John Kochai and Manuel Munoz. Moderating tonight's conversation with the authors is Kate Cuddle. Kate is an executive editor at People Magazine covering books. She is a past president of the National Book Critics Circle and a former editor of the books pages at the Boston Globe. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and many other publications. Her author profiles include Salman Rushdie and Patricia Lockwood, and her essays have ranged from pondering the popularity of true crime stories among women readers to recounting the year in her childhood when she strongly identified with disgraced President Richard Nixon. <laughs> when I was reading this bio earlier, I had to go look up that essay. It is wonderful. You must read it. Please join me in welcoming Kate. I feel like that Nixon line is hard to live down, but <laughs> now I'm not a fan. <laughs> but um, welcome everyone and welcome especially to our authors. Um, and I hope Angie will join us in due time, which will be exciting. Um, gosh, I guess I want to say first of all, um, it's so good to have you here. And we're here to um, see who wins the award. Winning an award is a huge thing for an author. And I'm curious if you just 
could each talk a little bit about what it means to find yourself nominated, find yourself a finalist for an award, that kind of external um, affirmation, what it means, because writing is one of the most solitary and sort of unheralded acts that we do. Well, you know, I mean, it's always um, it's always a tremendous surprise. I have to say, um, you know, it, like you said, it's it, writing is um, it's such a solitary act, and we spend so much of our time, at least you know, at least I do, um, just alone by ourselves, typing away at this computer, like, talking to ourselves, oftentimes with these characters in our heads, and um, and then you know, it always feels like a huge risk to then put all of that on the page and and to offer it to someone else and. And then even beyond that, then to offer it to sort of the, the whole country, and um, and so whenever you know, for me, whenever I do receive an affirmation like this, it's um, it's, it's it's lovely. It's a, it's a huge surprise, and and I finally get to come out of my cave and, and put on a suit and, and mingle and and do all those things that um, you know writing's all about. So. <laughs> Um, it's definitely a validation. It's certainly a surprise um, and not something I'm accustomed to. But one of the things that I really love about it, it brings me back to my days as a bookseller um, from oh, years and years ago. Oh, I didn't ago. know this and about I, you. Well, I used to have these, you know, little, you know, I'd follow the list and sometimes I would have my own favorites. You know, so when Gene Thompson was nominated for the National Book Award in 99, um, I was pushing that book as a, a you know. So th those kinds of things of gaining new readers and reaching, reaching audiences that we might not otherwise uh, have been, would have been able to reach is I think one of the points of the awards as opposed to, you know, merely just sort of celebrating for celebration's sake. So it's, it's wonderful, it really is. Yeah, because it is, you know, as everybody here knows, it is so hard to, um, for books to compete, not only with each other, but also with everything else that is sort of clamoring for our attention, whether that's other forms of media, or whether that's just our busy lives, our children, our aging parents, whatever it is. Um, so anything that puts a book kind of right in front of your attention is so valuable to a writer. But I did want to sort of switch gears a little bit because um, and Jamil and I were talking about this last night, you, I, I looked you up on Kirkus today, and um, Kirkus describes the book as stunning, compassionate, and flawless, which is sort of the kind of review you would, you know, want your best friend to, you know, write under a pseudonym. But at the same time, <laughs> but at the same time, you were on the receiving end of one of the meanest, worst reviews of, of any really talented writer I know in the Times, um, from a guy who seemed animated uh, by a, a strange desire to, to read a different kind of book than the one you wrote. And I wonder you know, if you could talk a little bit about how it feels to be misread and, and what that, uh, you, I mean, I guess you can't do anything about that, but what does it make you, do, do you do anything differently? Do you, do you just bury it? Do you read your reviews? No, I mean, yes, yeah, certainly I, I read my reviews. That, that review in particular, you know, we'd been, we'd been waiting um, months for that review because, you know, it is the New York Times, and so um, it was a huge deal. Um, I, I, you know, I have to say it was, uh, it was shocking initially to read it. Um, it was, I was up uh, at 4 a.m. that day. Uh, my, my daughter had woken up. I, we just put her back to sleep. And I made the mistake of, of then scrolling through Twitter, and someone had tagged me in the post, and, and they were already upset about the review. And so I re read the review, and then, um, you know, it immediately sort of flabbergasted. And, um, and you know, I, I, I sort of thought I was, uh, I, I was going crazy. I was like, how, how could they have published this review? And, um, and, and, and then just a couple of hours later, however, um, uh, Twitter woke up, and, and yeah. so there was a lot of <laughs> a lot of folks came to my defense on Twitter, which meant meant the whole world to me at that time. Because um, you know, that, that it was, initially it was devastating, and um, and then you know, for me, the the more that I thought about it, to be honest, like it, it did end up becoming sort of um, an affirmation of some of the political objectives of my work. You know, my my work it's um, it's anti-war. It's 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 anti-U.S. occupation. And and if that's gonna you know upset certain people, then 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 that's fine. And um, and you know those 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 sorts of readers. You know, I think it might be it might be important for their worldviews to be shaken a little bit. And so um, and so for that reason, I 
I've sort of <laughs> uh, taken it now with a sort of grain of salt. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, two things. One thing, all the people who defended you on Twitter, it wasn't just people who were friends. It was kind of the whole writing community, I thought, or at least, you know, large chunks. Um, and he, he really, that reviewer, wanted to read a book in which somebody would be nice to um, white American servicemen, mm. which was a strange, I thought, tack, and revealed his pol more about his politics than anything. Manuel, do you read your reviews? Um, when they arrive, <laughs> I, mean, I don't. I don't. I don't get as many. Um, <laughs> but so I'm on the lookout, and when they come, it's it's really wonderful. Um, no, honestly, the the first the first two weeks, I think, of the consequences being out, it was very quiet. It was very quiet, and I, I went to an event about a week later at the Miami Book Festival yeah. where I was reading with Sandra Cisneros, and I was telling Sandra about it, and publicly she said, you know, what's going on, <laughs> you know, on the stage? And she said, what happened, New York Times? And so we were sort of thinking, maybe she shook the tree um, a little bit, but they were on their way, I think, for short story collections and smaller independent presses. The attention sometimes isn't there. Um, immediately, and I'm understanding of that um, as somebody who, again, um, worked as a bookseller. I also worked in publishing, so okay, I know so that there know. are timelines that come yeah. along, and one must be patient. So. Well, there used to be so much more room for book reviews in, in newspapers. The newspapers used to be bigger and healthier. Right. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing. I'd love to ask both of you where the titles of your books come from. Shall I start, or do you want to start? Um, mine comes from a lot of conversations. I, I go to college campuses quite a bit, and um, they're often students who are uh, seeing the kinds of stories happening in their own backyard, especially California students. Um, and they often would ask me, why is it that you speak about aftermath? Why is it that you show us some really terrible things but never show us what actually happened? Mm. And the word consequences would come up quite a bit. Um, and it started to hang around as an idea, as a concept. Um, and it, was, it, it became a word that, that was useful for reflection about what I was doing in my stories and why I gravitated towards certain narratives. Um, and then the word just started to have weight. Mm -hmm. um, um, and weight probably that I wasn't anticipating in the way that readers started to receive not just the title story, but many others as well. Do you think that does, in the way that you positioned the book and the way that you started thinking about it, because I imagine short story writers are often writing, you know, a, a variety of stories and then they coalesce into a book somehow. Did the idea of consequences, was it already in your mind as the stories began to coalesce in a book or was it after you put it together? It was, well, I, I, it's a funny story how this came about because I wasn't really working on a book. Mm. I was working on stories. I didn't have a publisher, and I didn't know where the book was going to land. I didn't know where I was going, frankly. And there was uh, an editor, and I really want to say her name, it's Sara Reggiani from Edizioni Black Coffee in Florence, I believe, who had come across a story called Susto and had never heard of me and got in touch with my agent and said, um, I would like to buy the book. And I said, what book? There's no book, <laughs> but there was something about her enthusiasm um, that made me go back and look at the, at the stories that I was writing to think more clearly about what I was doing. And I think that's probably why, um, how solid and concrete that word was, the consequences, that made it much easier to help me co you know, uh, co um, what's the word I'm looking for? Coalesce, did, did I want that? I, I don't, Oh, see now you, now you see what I do at two thirty in the morning. Of course, to We're bring the doing stories that. together. Yeah. Here comes Angie Cruz. <laughs> Welcome, Angie. We are just just to catch you up. We are doing a little round of questions about where did the title of your book come from. So uh, Jamil is next, and then you. So the title um, for The Haunting of Haji Otak, it was, um, it was difficult. You know, I'd put the entire collection together 
the book had been written, and, um, and, and I couldn't figure out what exactly the title of the book was going to be. You know, there was a couple of um, titles that, of, of individual stories that, um, that I really liked. Hungry Ricky Daddy, for example, was one of them. And, um, but, you know, I, I had a couple of discussions with my agent and I, and, uh, and we both sort of agreed that that didn't sort of encapsulate the, the book as a whole, the collection as a whole. And, um, and the last story in the collection, is, I think it was actually the last story I'd written for the collection, um, The Haunting of Haji Hotuk, we ended up going with that one. Um, just because this sense of like being haunted by by a war or or a loved one or a loss or or a homeland, it was sort of this um, recurring theme throughout the book, and so and so for that reason, um, ultimately it felt appropriate to to give it the title. And how about you, Angie? Yours is yours, of course, is discussed in the book, um, yeah. and it's such a beautiful and strange concept. Oh yeah, you, I think yours works. Yeah, so, oh my God, okay, I'm catching my breath here. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, I'm very late. I was in the Bronx um, with a special event with writers of color, and I could not say no. So here I am, I'm here. Thank you, everyone. Um, so my title, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water, it was originally called The Immigrant Handbook, and I was stuck on this title, and um, I think it went through some algorithm through the publishing machine where it ended up being in manuals. And they were like, that's not going to be good for your novel. It's just going to get lost in some kind of manual. And, um, and then I, was, I only had like a day or two to come up with a title. And I was with, um, you know, my editor had given me some ideas. And she's like, what about something with water? Or, you mentioned water a lot. She drinks a lot of water. And, um, and I was with two poets, um, Diana Coywin and Yona Harvey, wonderful poets. You should check her, them out if you don't know their work. And I, we just finished teaching class, and I was like, I don't know what to do about this title. I said, I feel like I'm drowning in a glass of water, which is something that my mother always tells me when I come in with a problem. Like, I just walked in like late. She'd be like, you always look like you're drowning in a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, but I am drowning, you know? So in some ways, I thought, oh, that's... Cara Romero. Cara Romero is telling her story um, to this job counselor every week, and she has problem after problem after problem. So in some ways, the title works in two ways. It's like how not to drown in a glass of water. It's like how talking through something helps you get out of the thing that you feel that you are drowning in. But also, it's kind of um, signaling to this wonderful word in Spanish called desahogo which is the undrowning. So we talk or we cry until we can't no more. Um, yeah, and undrown. I love that. And that brings up something that I wanted to talk to you all, all of you about, which is language uh, in the book, in your prose. Um, and not just the, the artistic language of the, the prose writer, but um, the, the language used by people who grow up in bilingual households and how for many, many years, and many of you will remember this, books published in the United States in English, if they had words in them that were not in English, they would be italicized or they would be glossed in some way, either in the text or there would even be a glossary. Um, and that all started to change a few years ago. And I'm curious because you know these are books, especially the, the, the books with Spanish in them, are just so, um, there, it's really peppered in, and um, you know, I speak a little bit of Spanish. There were there were words and phrases I recognized. There were many I didn't. So I just looked them up, you know, which I feels like the way to read a book. You should always be ready to look something up. But um, do you think that this is a, a a trend? Do you think this is just a reality that that now there's a language called American and it has room for more? voices, and how does that work for you as a prose writer? Have you had to struggle to get in different languages, you know, not English? I'll, I'll start. I'll, um, I, I published my first book in 2003, and some of my titles, even the word, I have a story called Monkey C, but C is yes in mm. Spanish, and it's italicized in the title. That has completely changed. It has completely changed. I love... 
I love any of those words that just do not have exact translations um, because they are signaling to certain audiences that there's already a complexity going to be built in. Right. And it helps me wonderfully, uh, whether it's a story like Compromisos, which sometimes people think is, oh, that means compromises, but not quite. It means something else, obligations, sometimes even deeper, familial um, obligations, something you can't escape. Susto is the same thing, might be a scare, but it's really more about the soul. So those kinds of um, excavations that we can do, um, it's, it's not even a question I'm getting anymore. I think with journals, they, I submit a story, nothing's italicized, and I don't even get a question, which is liberating. And I just have to say, the word I was looking for was collate. <laughs> and I, 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 I have to- I think someone had it out there. I, did it, I have to say it, because otherwise it's gonna be like, did I turn the iron off? Like, right. it'll be that, sorry. You know, for me, it was um, it was sort of this process of um, becoming acclimated, or um, or just sort of discovering that I could write in this voice that felt natural to my own upbringing, this voice that I'd heard all my life in my own household. Um, you know, when I first started writing fiction, I was reading a lot of um, Cormac McCarthy and Ernest Hemingway and William Faulkner. And so everything that I wrote was like a poor imitation of those writers. And it was so bad, like it was the worst writing in the world. And, um, and it wasn't until that like, it wasn't until I got to this place where I realized, you know, that I could write in this voice that was, that could sometimes mix up, you know, English and Pashto and Farsi and Arabic. Um, just whenever it felt natural, you know, because those those are things where, uh, you know, when in, in my household, we'll, we'll just sort of slip in and out, and, and there are particular things, and especially, you know, when we're, um, it, it's, I think it's oftentimes a very tied to emotion, you know, when, sure. um, where, when, when someone's angry, they slip into another language, or or also, you know, when we're joking around, we'll, we'll uh, and, and those that's one of the things that I'll do is I'll put little jokes in, in Pashto in the book, and so for me, it's just fun, it, it feels natural, and, um, and it, it you know, and I feel very fortunate uh, by the fact that there has been um, this readership open to that, to that form, to that style of writing. Yeah, I feel like you both answered kind of the ways that I would answer. I think the thing I would add is that I don't think I've ever had Spanish italicized in my work, and my first book was in 2001, but that's not because I was the first. I feel like there were writers like Juno Diaz. I'm pretty sure Sandra Cisneros did an italicize, if I remember. Um, so in some ways, the path was opening, but with a fight, right? Like, I think there were battles that were fought, and... I'm sure there were. I benefited from it, mm -hmm. and, and there's a consequence, right? Because when you don't italicize or you don't use quotation marks, which for me is also a language issue, like, my characters are code-switching, Many of them are speaking Spanish. Um, if you read in Spanish, they don't use quotation marks. So for me, to use quotation marks made me feel like I wasn't being um, loyal to the language um, or sort of erasing an underpinning to the language that I wanted to be in the text. So in some ways, like I didn't have to fight the battle because I think people before me have, but I do think that there's less of a consequence for it, right? I think that now, many readers are, are more excited about looking at the way text is expanding, English is expanding, because so many of us that have always been, <laughs> you know, right. speaking many languages and thinking in different languages have been pushing and pushing um, against English. So it becomes more rich and interesting. Yeah, it's an expansion you know, of, of, of what we can understand. And certainly it expands a reader's mind to know how a character talks. Um, it's interesting that you say loyalty to the language. I love that. And I wonder, for people who are um, coming out of a tradition where you are maybe the first person in your family to be writing about uh, kind of people who have been marginalized or under or underrepresented in literature how 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 does that work in terms of your wanting to be loyal to their voices but also was there ever care about like am i airing dirty laundry am i going to embarrass somebody um, not that you're writing nonfiction, but even fictional characters, of course, are revealing a world to a whole lot of readers who have no idea 
those worlds even exist, maybe. Um, how do you do that and stay true to, the, to your elders and your past without feeling kind of strangled by them? I have a, a really, like, and you know, my mom is going to be totally embarrassed because she's here, but um, <laughs> so what? <laughs> Speaking of loyalty, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I remember when my first book came out, Soledad, my mother read the back of the book, and she's like, oh my God, you told everyone our business? And then she read the book, and she's like, who are these people? Why aren't you writing about us? <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, for me, like, that's, that, that's certainly been, like, a, like a primary concern of mine. It, it, it continues to be a struggle, this idea that, um, you know, am I am I telling these stories wrong? Am I um, am I exploiting these stories? Am I, uh, you know? So th those are um, those are continu It's a continuous struggle, and you know, I'm fortunate in that you know my my family's been incredibly supportive of my um, of my career and of my different writing practices, and they're always open to to telling me stories, and um, and I try to be you know I try to be as open with them uh, as much as possible. You know, my, some of my first critics. Um, are, are in fact my, my siblings. They're the first people that I send my books to um, or my stories to, and you know they don't hold back at all because they the, this sucks or this isn't funny or cut this out or whatever. And so um, so for me, you know, it's it's um, it, it, it has been a struggle. It continues to be a struggle. Um, but but as much as possible, I do try to make it um, a, a, sort of a, a collaborative effort. I want to make sure that um, you know that, that 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 my sort of storytelling endeavor is. Uh, it feels appropriate to um, uh, uh, to their to their own truths as well. I think, to be honest, one must tell the truth, and to let go of shame, one must tell the truth. So that's always been my guiding principle with the stories that I tell, especially as somebody who comes from a very very impoverished um, background where even just describing conditions that other people are just, uh, they find them incredible in the truest sense of the word. That, th that can't be. It, it is. Um, but uh, also, as I've gotten older and speaking to my parents and learning about their stories, um, you know, the, the issue of respect and, and, and what to tell is certainly in the forefront of my mind, but it's also just the fact that they have lived a history that I think deserves to be on the page. And that holds true for just, just about every story I know of my community. Somehow or another, it's got to make it onto the page um, because it's true and it's honest and it helps us let go of pain, essentially. Yeah, that's really interesting. It reminds me of, um, do you know the Mexican-American writer Ricoberto Gonzalez? Um, he's a poet, and uh, but he's also written memoir, and he's been very open and honest about some extreme struggles, you know, that his family went through, and um, I, it, it's it's been revelatory for the reader, but I also think for him. Um, one of the things that happens to people when they are poor or uh, refugees or immigrants. Uh, is that they face a lot of bureaucracy. And all three of your books have bureaucratic moments. Um, some uh, dealt with sort of realistically, some turned into kind of fantastical and strange and kind of you know, twisted um, language around them. I'm thinking, Angie, of your, you know, that just the, the, the sort of interspersed um, bits of, of legalese and job hunting, they're so fascinating to me. And I'm curious, like, how do you, as a, as a fiction writer, take on the form, uh, write about stuff that, that maybe people don't know about facing bureaucracy, but also how do you, you, how do you twist it to your own aims as a fiction writer? Well, I want to say that when I wrote How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water, I actually was thinking about readers that would read my book for the first time. Like, I would be their first reader. So with Dominicana, because it was named Dominicana, it signaled to a lot of book buyers that would not necessarily be book buyers, and they would learn a lot about what happened in the 60s in their own community. And I said, oh my god, could fiction? 
be a handbook. And this is where the immigrant handbook idea came out, mm. like thinking, wait, can I actually teach people in New York how to read a lease so they could actually keep their apartments? I lost my apartment and it was very painful because mm. I didn't know how to defend myself or how to keep that apartment because I didn't understand the language and no one I knew understood how to work around that lease so I could keep that apartment. So now I think about it and I say, could my book, even though it's literature, let's say you're reading it because you're just like, oh, look, this Dominican person read the book or this person in the neighborhood read the book, um, wrote this book. I'll read it and they'll learn something about what this language is doing, but also the possibility for survival mm. in a city where a system is so rigged against the working class. Yeah, you know, I mean, th th that was really, I think, one of my like most uh, harrowing realizations when I was sort of growing up and, and entering adulthood for the first time was coming to terms with the fact that um, how much of this country functions or, or runs through um, these different bureaucracies yeah. and, and realizing that they're absolutely soul crushing, that they, that they, you know, uh, uh, they, they crush people, they dehum dehumanize people. And, and one of the things that I came to realize, you know, especially when I was, um, um, when, when I would, when I would, work, when I would work, for example, when I would um, help my parents with their, with their medical or their legal documents. And one of the things that I realized is that in one way or another, over and over again, when I was filling out their applications, their ages, the, their different pains, the things that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, I realized I was, I was telling their stories over and mm. over again, but in the worst possible format, you right. know? And, and it was over and over again, I felt like I was like, I was like pleading with like this faceless, monstrous being that, that just wanted to eat us, you know? And, um, and, so, and so for that reason, you know, uh, years and years later, um, uh, I would think back on those times and I sort, of, I, I, I sort of posed this as a challenge to myself and I was like, you know, could I, um, could I actually write a story, a meaningful story from a bureaucratic document? And I ended up, um, and so I ended up writing this whole story that was, uh, that was just, it's essentially it's just a job resume. It's amazing. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Occupational hazards. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a man's life in the, you know, as a resume. Yeah, that's, yeah. Th that's exactly right. And so, um, you know, it was, it was a tremendous challenge, but, um, but, but, it, but it did, it, you know, it came from this idea of, you know, how, 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 are, how are stories crushed by these bureaucracies and, and how can we bring them back to light? You know, for me, just getting older and starting to get even more uh, intimate and closer with my parents about the kinds of experiences they had, my mother was born in the States, but my father was not, so we often experienced him being deported, coming back. But as a child, I didn't know anything except absence. Mm -hmm. It was only older where I started to ask questions like, well, how exactly did you do this? And it was about the pride that my mother had. Um, she really gets upset if anybody's using the cell phone at the dinner table. And that gets her off talking about credit cards and money. and. Um, and how she managed to do all of these things without any conveniences whatsoever. That's what started, I think, my interest in, in, in pushing them to give me more stories about, um, you know, what was it like when, I mean, if it's terrible now when it's militarized, um, what was it like in the 70s and 80s when it wasn't as much? But at the same time, um, there weren't as many consequences for people who you know, would take someone's uh, labor for a whole week and not pay right. them at the end of the week. Um, things would just fly under the radar. So all of those kinds of inquiries I thought were important to ask about to, to learn how they navigated um, those um, powerful forces. Did all three of you talk, do you, do you feel that as writers, a lot of your research has just been talking to your parents or listening to your parents tell their stories? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for me, you know, it's really at the heart of much of my writing. And, um, you know, I was, I'm very fortunate to have come from, um, you know, like this, this oral storytelling tradition. And I come from, I came from a household filled with these tremendous, tremendous 
um, storytellers. And so throughout my life, I was hearing these incredible stories. And then once I began writing my own books, a, a much of my research process did, in fact, just stem from you know sitting with my parents or other relatives or family members and um, and just asking them for their stories. And 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 time and again, it would be um, so incredibly harrowing and, and sorrowful, but also. Um, you know, very uh, incredibly funny and and um, and inspirational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't always have to be about asking about the traumatic experiences, but also asking them about their joy. I mean, mm -hmm. I've asked my mom, and I encourage I encourage my students, I encourage all of you, um, if you have your parents still with you, ask ask your parents when they first fell in love. My oh, wow. my, my mother's first crush was Ricky Nelson. <laughs> so, and that made it into a bit of writing yes, because yes. it became like, oh wow, mom, really? Why? She says, oh, he had beautiful lips. <laughs> you know, so there are all sorts of, you know, one, the whole spectrum of the emotions are there as long as we're willing to listen. But I feel too like, for me, what has compelled me to write is what they won't say. It's the gaps and silences in the stories and I feel like when you've experienced so much trauma due to, you know, working class conditions or poverty or, or struggle or immigration, it's full, immigrants are full of secrets. I mean, there's so many secrets, right? One, because you don't feel safe um, and you're just really good at being, you know, mysterious about them because you don't know who you can trust. And I feel like, um, for me, it's the not knowing that's made me really interested in, in writing books. And, um, and I think that, um, even though I think I do come from amazing storytellers, they're really good at talking about other people. <laughs> um, but what I did was interview a lot of people, anyone who's willing to talk to me. I would go through photographs and sit with them and say, what was it like to live in the 60s? What was it like to live in the Great Recession? What was, what was it like? How much did you get paid? That's my favorite. How much did you get paid? And why did you quit that job? And you learn so much that's not even in the history books, especially about the Latino working class, because so much is not documented. So yeah, I always encourage my students to do the same. Like, just ask questions and talk to people who are living historians. Mm -hmm. Do all three of you teach creative writing? I do, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so this is interesting. What are you finding um, when you read your students' work um, do you feel, does it make you feel optimistic about the state of American fiction? Um, are there things that you wish they would be doing differently? Are there things that they are doing that are blowing your mind? I'd love to know about the next generation of writers that you all are encountering in your classrooms. Okay, it's on me. Well, my students are watching, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just left, you know, I just met with some amazing students um, at Fordham, and I was talking to them, and what I, when I hear them read their work, it's so feeling-oriented in a way that I feel that my generation of writers, like, I was raised not to feel anything to survive in the system, so in some ways I feel like I have calluses all over my body, and I do feel like what this book is doing is sort of trying to bridge between generations, like, the ones that are just like, suck it up! And, you know, just make it all work. And, and in some ways, all this sucking it up and resilience has basically um, made us complicit to a system that um, is working against a lot of the people that I care about in my community. So when I have my students that they're all caught up in their feelings and, and deeply sensitive, I'm like, wow, maybe this is the superpower and the thing we need to change the world. Because even though it must be really hard to have all those feelings, it also is challenging all of us to change the world so we don't have to have all these microaggressions thrusted against us. So that's what I'm noticing in the work and I'm really curious what's gonna happen in the work. I think it's slowly coming up, but um, I find it really interesting and I'm hoping that it helps make a difference because this world is not changing. I feel like I'm talking about the same thing and it's been like 25 years of writing. I mean, for me, one of the things that has been like um, really inspirational, I think, is how, uh, I mean, at least to me, it feels like the, the this next generation of writers are 
um, they're so incredibly like politically conscious. You know, my my uh, I, I have a little sister, and um, she's 17. But even when she was like 16, 15 years old, she'd be talking about. Um, colonization and and syst uh, systemic racism and all these terms that like when I discovered them in college were so eye-opening to me and she's just talking about them like you know th this is what happens and then she's telling me all about it and so it's one of those things where um, you know I do think that um, that there are these certain develop developments which um, which it, it makes me very optimistic about the the, the state of writing and, and and where it's going into the future. Yeah, I share that optimism, too. Uh, with my graduate students, they, they come in so incredibly aware and self-possessed and confident. Um, but where the, the joy for me, the true joy, is with the undergraduates. Because what I really love about them is that they're in so many different stages of, of awareness. And once they, they respect what it means to need things to relate to them, but then also develop this other muscles. Like I also need to figure out how to relate to others as well. And sort of watching them sort of build their empathy along with their curiosity is phenomenal. I just love, so my 215, they're watching. I miss you. <laughs> Hi students. <laughs> Maybe some of them will be sitting on this stage in 15 years, you never know. I think we're out of time. I just want to thank you all so much for joining in this conversation. It was great. Uh, how about another round of applause? Thank you to Kate and the finalists. That was just so amazing. Thank you. Um, before we get to the, the big moment, because we just want to keep you in suspense as long as possible, my colleague Carolyn Torrey, who's the managing director at Aspen Words, has a few important thank yous. Yes, I know we're all itching to find out, so I'll keep this brief. Um, but I want to give a big thank you to tonight's presenting sponsors, uh, Zibby Books and Peter Rigby. Um, I also want to shout out the Pitkin County Library in Aspen, Colorado, where they're hosting a viewing party. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, thanks also to the extraordinary Aspen Words team who put this all together, um, Elizabeth Nix, Mallory Kaufman, Madeline Lipton and Ivy Chalmers, thanks. <laughs> and finally, thank you to the anonymous donors whose extraordinary gift has endowed this prize in perpetuity so we can be back here every year. Um, and now, uh, without further ado, Omar, the moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Well glued. <laughs> and the winner is The Haunting of Haji Hotak by Hamil Han Hotak. Thank you so much. Um, this is such an incredible honor. Um, I want to thank the, the Aspen Institute, um, the, the Aspen Awards Board, um, the organizers for tonight's event, um, the, the brilliant judges, and um, <laughs> I, I didn't know it was going to come off like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Um, and, and, and thank you to my um, infinitely talented nominees. Um, it's, it was such an honor to be listed among them. Um, thank you to my agent, Janal, and, and my editor, uh, Laura Tisdale. Um, uh, thank you to my family, my, my mother and father, my brothers and sisters, uh, my wife, Nazifa, and my little daughter, Selgay, um, who's been making a, a, a courageous effort not to bother me as much as she can during my little writing sessions. Um, I have to say, um, it feels uh, a little lonesome up here by myself um, because this book is a culmination of, of multiple generations of storytellers, my Adi and Agha and my Moor, my uncles and aunts, my cousins and siblings. Um, I was blessed to grow up in a household filled with what um, Salibo Magnificent would call the word, uh, stories spoken aloud, passed from the teller to the listener, um, and no one else, this, this, this intimate passage. All of my stories, the dead marks I leave on the page are written in the shadow of the great storytellers who spoke the word before me. And ultimately, all praise be to Allah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And we'll um, have a reception out um, outside the auditorium. So please join us. Um, and all of the finalist books are available for purchase in the lobby as well. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so we'll have